Hello and welcome to topic number 7 of the OCI GCSE Computing course. We're looking at software today, the last 5 or 6 videos have all been about hardware and today we're cramming everything into one video about software because if you've noticed I'm following the specification as it lists it and lists all of this stuff in the same chapter, the same topic, um, so I'll be following it like that. Um, so a lot to cover in today's video, let's start with recapping what hardware is. So hardware is the physical parts for make up a computer system. Software are the programs used to control a computer system. Pretty standard, just want to make sure it's nice and clear before we begin. So first of all we've got to look at what is known as an operating system. Hopefully you would have heard of what this is, but essentially it's the essential software. Your computer needs an operating system for, you, for human interaction to take place. As you'll see, oh, but basically what it does, it links the hardware and other software, so other applications, other programs together. And if we've got, you can look at a diagram here. So you can see we've got the user who interacts with the applications, the other programs on your computer. And those applications interact with the operating system and they allow, through essentially through the oper operating system, they allow access to the hardware. So it sort of bridges the gap between the applications and the hardware. You can think of it like that. So it's essential software that links it together with other software which is slightly hard to understand but um, if we look at some functions uh, in the next slide hopefully that will clear it up so let's just have a look at three examples so Android, Linux and Windows are three examples and iOS on your um, Apple devices etc lots of op operating systems that are used by lots of people because it's essential obviously um, so if we look at some functions of op an operating system the functions are the same for every operating system it's not it's not um, brand or company specific so in the operating system you have what is known as the kernel element kernel I find it absolutely absolutely bizarre that the word is kernel because I just think of popcorn popcorn kernel but I guess it's this little uh, nugget I don't really want to say that but nugget of code in the operating system code that manages the tasks of the computer and the hardware. Um, so the way I like to think of it is it's sort of a king program as it rules over all the others. By the way, the, the specification does not list you need to know about kernel, but if I show you in, in a minute, I'll make clear why I'm talking about it. So you can see there's a little bit of a kernel, it interacts with the applications and through that the hardware can be accessed. So an important function of the operating system and specifically the kernel through the kernel it works um, is memory management so the kernel has complete access to the memory of the computer and its role is to safely allow access to the memory that the programs require so essentially the kernel's job is to manage memory access it makes sure that multiple programs if you're running multiple programs at any given time it makes sure that they don't all interfere with the same memory for example if you um, are trying to change a file name you can't change a file name or edit anything to do with the file while it's already open so say if you have a word document already open you can't then change the file in uh, Microsoft Explorer for example um, so that's the function of memory management also it plays an important role in multitasking on the computer so instead of processes happening sequentially which just simply means one after the other so instead of the processor simply sort of ticking off the list of processes and doing them all after each other so in a nice list the kernel does allow programs to work concurrently and concurrently means it can overlap so they're not running parallel so they're not running each at the same time but they are overlapping slightly so they're using one function of the CPU at one time and then another program is using another section of the CPU for, for do, to, to do something and this, the kernel allows this to happen um, and this gives the user the, the impression and, and does allow you to multitask on your computer you can have lots of programs open and it, um, processes can happen concurrently so almost at the same time and this is a function that your operating system does um, so if you look at some non-kernel relating things like I say you don't specifically need to talk about a kernel if you had an exam exam question but if you want to impress the examiner then you can talk about the kernel um, so other functions that don't really involve it are to, to do with the user interface so the user interface is sometimes referred to as the shell so in Python if you code of Python you call it the Python shell because your interface to code in Python is the program that you use and the user interface is essential for human interaction if there wasn't anything there clearly you can't do anything with it and 
a user interface can be as simple as a command line which was used in the past so this is a com picture of a command line often when you start your computer off, computer off you get some command line prompts There's also you can um, use your CMD which is a command line something um, just to do certain instructions to your computer it was used in the, like here 1980s onwards um, MS uh, DOS disk operating system I think is what it stands for was used and it was purely command prompt but nowadays we have what is called graphical user interfaces lots of people like to call them GUI that's the acronym but lots of people like to pronounce it GUI instead of GUI but it doesn't really matter and fortunately these are far more easy to use because you have pictures you have icons you have um, yeah it's just generally easier to use it's obviously far easier to use than um, command prompt so another function of an operating system is to provide security so it will do this to a certain extent often you like to buy or download other programs that help with security but what it does it must be able to distinguish between legitimate program requests and illegitimate ones so on your computer say if you had a virus or a program that's not designed to be there it's got in your computer maybe accidentally you downloaded it or someone has deliberately put it on your computer it needs to realize which requests from programs are real and which ones aren't so, so a request from Microsoft Word will be legitimate one from a virus will be illegitimate and it does this by basically authenticating each request you don't really need to know too much how it does this I don't really know how it does this I guess it's, it's unique to each operating system but it just basically checks it and checks each request to make sure they're legitimate. And um, clearly, um, these programs, the illegitimate programs, are designed so that they can trick the operating system. And that's when you'd perhaps want to use a third-party program, which is maybe better designed and up to date as well. Um, so finally, the last function that you need to know about of your operating system. These these are definitely not a complete list. These are probably the most basic functions that are useful to know about. So peripheral management a peripheral device is a piece of hardware that interacts with the computer so an example of a peripheral device is a keyboard a graphics card a monitor and the operating system's job is to make sure they work it manages all these peripheral devices and they use what are known as drivers so often if you install maybe a mouse automatically you'll get a little, little balloon popping up saying that you're installing the drivers and it does it for you it ensures that they're up to date it ensures that everything's working together um, by using drivers and using other software that are designed to work with each one so that's the final function you probably need to briefly mention each of these if there was an answer you might get given an example to talk about security or talk about the user interface and you might literally it might be a two mark answer three mark answer just briefly explain what it's about and explain why it's needed so um, this slide I better get some water this slide is all about utility programs mm. so this slide took me ages to do because I tried to, my brilliant idea was to try and fit it on one slide which is quite difficult. Um, so we've got to look at three types of utility programs, security, disk organization and system maintenance and these are three sort of um, genres of utility programs and these are, these are programs that are used to, how can I define utility, used to help you in some way. So let's first look at security. So on your computer, you, you may pre-install to have some antivirus software. And antivirus software are programs that detect and eliminate malicious software. So software intent intent on damaging your computer or deleting stuff. It could I don't. It's quite a general term. Virus it can just just basically you don't want it to be there. And on your computer, you will have some kind of antivirus installed usually. Um, but people like to download their own ones because, like I mentioned before, they're often not up to date because hackers are designing new viruses daily and they'll use the latest techniques and the latest antivirus should in theory sort of catch up with them so you want to make sure your antivirus is up to date so you can download that from a third party um, company um, also you have firewalls installed in your network and these are a network system that control and filter incoming and outgoing traffic so you, you can think of it like a wall that filters through in incoming and outgoing traffic making sure that you're not connecting to websites that are dodgy websites that are going to install spyware links onto my next point quite nicely so yeah that's what a file does it filters everything on your network so spyware protection spyware is a type of software that gathers and sends information about you so if you have spyware on your computer it will gather information about you maybe your passwords your um, 
you, you might have a keylogger so it records whatever you type and if it sends this to a hacker they can gather all this information about you and use it against you so an example of this is a Trojan you don't need to know what a Trojan is but it's just an example of software that's spyware and most spyware protection programs simply block the threat so it's difficult to um, eliminate them but some try to eliminate them I'm not sure how they do but it's easy to simply block them by making sure they're not downloaded or making sure they can't do anything too dangerous so if you look at programs to do with disk organization there's one um, you built into Microsoft Windows at least and I'm sure almost every operating system there's a program to do a formatting and this is the process this allows you to partition sections of your your hard drive before files are stored so this is sort of an automatic process that simply prepares your hard drive your secondary storage for, to have files stored in it so you often you won't you can some people like to do this themselves so some people like to have an SSD and a hard drive working together and on the SSD they might have the operating system stored on because that loads it up really quickly because it's got a fast read write time as we looked at in a previous video and this is a form of partitioning and you would use a formatting program to do this and they're usually pre-installed but I'm sure you can download third party ones that may be best designed um, another disk organization tool another program is a defragmentation program and essentially when you have lots of data or um, stored in your hard drives they can get scattered about data can be stored on each end of a platter on a hard disk so on the disk they can the data for one program maybe is sort of scattered about and naturally if especially with hard drives where it spins it has to retrieve all these little bits and it has to access them either side of a disk it has to travel a long distance which slows it down so defragging a disk essentially reorganizes related data and when it organizes the data they're stored together on the hard drive as opposed to apart meaning that they're accessed quicker don't need to know this in too much detail but I would just if you got asked about it just write what I've written there um, you can also there are also file transfer programs so these programs allow files to be moved around copied and deleted by the user nice and easily um, an example of this is yeah so Windows Explorer which is actually a program you go into my computer you go into my documents that's actually a program that allows you to do that and allows you to copy delete move around data uh, and uh, files I should say and that's a program that allows you to do it. You might not recognize it as a program, but it definitely is. Um, so if you look at system maintenance now, there are system cleanup tools, so system cleanup programs, and these speed the performance of a computer up by deleting files that aren't used, files that maybe are from programs that have been deleted, that weren't removed properly. It basically cleans your computer, computer up, which in turn improves your performance. Um, also, you have automatic update programs. So these you have them automatically installed on your computer you have a Windows automatic update program but for example iTunes I find it really annoying when I, whenever I go on iTunes um, Apple always gets me to try and automatically update them I always click no um, but these are programs that search online find and download software that um, have a new update so if a developer releases a new update for some software these programs will aut automatically find it download it and maybe even install it for you which is meant to be easy for you save you time but quite often it's a bit annoying but still that's quite an, a useful program in some contexts um, finally on this slide we've got to look at system information and diagnostics so these programs basically the system information part they keep the specifications of your hardware so if you go to my computer and properties it, it shows you all the um, for example your clock speed how much RAM you've got your hard drive capacity and that that those specifications are just stored in that simple program and through diagnostics tools diagnostic if you if a doctor diagnoses you of something it means they are um, working out what's wrong with you so if they diagnose you with a cold it means you have a cold and a diagnostic program will check if whatever you're looking at is functioning right and if it isn't it might even suggest how you can fix it which is very useful okay a lot of information there maybe go back and pause if you're strong to take it in it's hard for me to speak let alone read and understand so I do apologize for that but I was trying to be as organized as possible so finally we've got to look at four types of software so first of all we've got to look at what custom written software is so custom written software as the name implies is software that's currently available to buy or download for free oh no sorry not download for free 
basically customer and software is software that has been designed spe specifically for you because there's software out there that doesn't meet your needs so if you want something if you want software to do a specific purpose for example I don't know opening a door for you opening your garage door and software isn't currently out there to do it you may either code it yourself or employ someone to code it for you so naturally um, custom written software does exactly what you want it to but especially if you so it takes a long time if you're writing it yourself or even if someone else is writing it for you and it can be very expensive to have someone code it specifically for you and if something goes wrong there's no really there's no real help available for example if you are coding a simple program you can often google it and a forum will have some information on it for you might help out but if it's your own specific use there probably won't be much available to help um, another type of software is off the shelf self, uh, software and these are programs that you can buy that are aimed at meeting lots of needs of users so basically off the shelf so software they try and please everyone for example Microsoft Word has lots of features you know it's probably got hundreds of features but how many would you actually really use maybe 10 15 so you have features that you'll never use but maybe someone out there will use them and they're designed to sort of please everyone sort of um, for generic software such as Microsoft Word PowerPoint Photoshop maybe these, these types of software so they're not custom written that's the point and they're relatively cheap because lots of people buy them there's a huge demand for these off-the-shelf softwares because they meet so many needs of users a bit of economics for you um, and they're thoroughly tested so usually bug free because they're usually by lots of big companies like Microsoft and there's lots of help available so if something goes wrong often they'll have a website that has an FAQ some help section you may even be able to call them up and ask them about it so there's lots of help available which is obviously a positive um, and ultimately open source software and this is a type of software with the source code so the code that's been written to program for program I don't really like that but um, yeah what have I written here so it, it's code that's freely available so you can download it, download it for free usually and it's because they provide the source code anyone can use it and modify it so you can even adapt it to your own use uh, your own needs if you really want to and it's usually free I don't know in many cases when it's not free but I read some of it's usually free, but I would you could probably get away with saying it's free. And finally, proprietary software is software that's commercially available but with licenses. So unlike open source software, in fact they often call it closed source, but I wouldn't write that right proprietary. I can't even say it now. Um, so you usually have to pay for it. And the source code isn't available, it's often copyrighted, maybe even painted depending on the circumstances meaning that you can't modify it or reverse engineer it. reverse engineering is when you um, get your final product and work backwards that's how the NSA um, listen in on people's conversations and things um, so yeah you can't edit it the source code isn't made public but so a downside is that it does cost money usually um, but updates are usually free meaning that if you buy software they'll often update it for you automatically and, f and you don't have to pay for it anymore um, it's also very well tested there won't be many bugs and it also another downside is that it may not be specific to your needs um, because it's it's commercially available it's not designed for you per se um, but that's it that's um, this has been I think the longest video I've ever made um, my voice is nearly lost um, so rewatch it if you've got time hopefully it made some sense it's not actually the hardest topic once you um, understand it, but it is a bit daunting. So thanks a lot for watching. If well done if you've got this far, and uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next video.